The tension mounted. Rutgers took the nation's longest winning streak, seven wins last season and ten this year, into the finale against Colgate in Giants Stadium. The Scarlet led 17-9, with just one second showing on the clock, with the Red Raiders on the Rutgers' eight-yard line. The entire season rested with the nation's top-ranked defense. Senior quarterback Don Harris saved the day, and the bells would soon ring out. Rutgers had a perfect 11-0 season, and the traditional bell ringing produced madness in the Meadowlands. Turan gathered further accolades as the leader of the Scarlet defense. Frank Burns gave a dressing room description of the perfect season. Oh, you may not know this now, but there's one thing. You will never, never the rest of your lives have an evening like tonight. Well, I think you want to remember the rest of your lives. University President Dr. Edward J. Blaustein was ecstatic. We lost the back-to-back unbeaten season. Yes. Basketball and football, first time in the world. Yes. Frank Burns' coaching record at Rutgers soared to 33, 10, and 1. Being undefeated uh, is, a, is a very difficult accomplishment. You know, I've, I've been coaching a long time, uh, 27 years. This, this is the second team that uh, I've been associated with, which has been undefeated. And there have been many, many coaches who have coached all their lives that uh, have never achieved that goal. So it is, it has to be a, a very satisfying thing. And uh, this, this may uh, sound trite, however, uh, I feel great for our football players. They're, they're the guys that really, they deserve the recognition. They, they earned it. And uh, they have all kind of confidence, not, not only in their team, but I think uh, the confidence within themselves. I believe we've made great inroads within the state of New Jersey because uh, primarily most of the people we have playing are Jersey kids. We've kind of made it uh, primarily through New Jersey athletes. Director Fred Runninger, who oversees a 26-sport program, saw the season as an indication of the total enthusiasm growing at Rutgers. The 1976 Rutgers football program this year has had a positive effect upon our campus, our students, our support of alumni and friends, but I think the greatest effect it had upon the state of New Jersey. We were able to identify to the state that we have a very strong athletic program and that we are the state of New Jersey. a season, dedicated leadership was essential. The Scarlet had superior quality in Dan Fobby of Louisville, Ohio, and Nate Turan of Perth Amboy, New Jersey. Such a group effort every game that we played, and I felt really proud to be elected by my teammates as a leader of this, along with Nate. And every game we won seemed to make me a little bit more confident in myself and my fellow players. I think that was a key last season this year, was uh, Everybody had confidence in the coaches, had confidence in themselves, had confidence in the guy playing next to them. And we knew we had to do a lot of work, and we just went out and did it. I like to think that we set a tradition here that uh, teams will try to follow, and, you know, and it's been sort of leaving a challenge for other um, teams of Rutgers team to follow. And uh, right there, that, that in itself is a rewarding feeling to me. I know it is to the team. It was also rewarding to watch Turan and the Scarlet Knight defense, which led the nation in three categories, a feat accomplished only by five teams in 40 years of
of official NCAA rankings. Rutgers was tops in total defense, defense against the rush, and tied Michigan in scoring defense. Dan Gray takes matters into his own hands on a fine individual effort. Alexander gets help from close friends Rich Wagner and Tim Blanchard. Linebackers Jim Hughes and Len Davis converge to stop a Navy runner. Wagner and Turan enjoy a day in Rutgers Stadium. Dino Mangiero and Hughes get together on this stop. The squalid linebacking duo of Hughes and Blanchard shut off another offensive try. This time it's Turan, Gray, and Elvin Washington blocking the path. company of Spalling. Defensive back Henry Jenkins, best in the nation in punt returns, he leads eight tackles on this run from his own 26 to the Connecticut 12. With a great display of blocking by Williams, Zimmerman, McMahon, and Moultrie, members of the Scarlet special team. A tough road opener started it all. Navy appeared one of the season's strongest opponents, and the deck seemed stacked against the Scarlet Knights. Would it be an entire fleet against a two-ball crew from New Jersey? At least it seemed so at the start. An early Navy torpedo, a 29-yard field goal, gave Rutgers a scare. But Harris's recovery turned the tide, with help from Wagner and Jim Tatum. Twitty's touchdown grab near the end of the half, the first of 36 Rutgers TDs, signaled the joy to come. It was sheer jubilation for the Scarlet Pass yardage leader. Mike Fisher contributed a picture run on a tossback with Mike Santorpio and John Bucci throwing key blocks. A naval King Kong was far from happy with the determined visitors. Behind road clearing blocks by John Walling and Jim O'Halloran, Jeff Gretchen got the day's final score by skipping 15 yards into the end zone, making it Rutgers 13, Navy 3, a vital victory to start the perfect season. A dejected Navy team was a striking contrast to the happy Scarlet Knights, who, after a road win over Bucknell, would face arch-rival Princeton in Palmer Stadium. The season's third game would find a new Rutgers star. But first, Mark Lasseter put the Scarlet on the scoreboard at the end of the first period on a four-yard burst behind Sauter and Fisher. Freshman Kenan Starzl's first of 11 field goals, a 25-yarder, gave Rutgers a 10-point lead. But it was sophomore Glenn Kaler's day as the fullback gained 130 yards in his first varsity start. Coach Burns was pleased. Well, that's right. The Princeton game it was the first game that Keeler had ever played for back, uh, you know, in college. He had been a halfback for us, and it was kind of an experiment. We decided to uh, try him uh, the week previous to the uh, Princeton game in practice to see how he came along, and he came along so well that we decided to give him a, give him a go, let him, let him start the game and see what would happen, and he responded uh, with a great effort. He had well over 100 yards in the football game. The Knights went in search of a second home win against Connecticut after a 21-14 victory over Cornell. Look here, one other thing. We're not doing anything different we have the game plan, right? All right? The only thing they've done is quit. They've been small safety press. Despite the 
right field. Lefties shut out the Huskies, 38 to nothing. The first points coming off Starzl's educated foot. Lassiter loses his defender, and a well-protected Burt Cossett finds him wide open for a 47-yard scoring strike. Fisher's determined drive for nine yards behind the blocking of Ray Kinch and Jeff Gretchen gave Rutgers a commanding 24 to nothing halftime lead. Towering tight end John Walling grabs a second half score and gets a big hug from Mark Twitty. Jeff Rebholz to Dusty Bryan TD toss puts the life of a cameraman on the line. Rutgers is 6 and 0. Rutgers and Columbia met at the Meadowlands in spanking new and spacious Giant Stadium on October 23, 1976, the very first collegiate game scheduled there. The contest was a charity affair for the Lion Sight Foundation, and more than 42,000 fans turned out to see the Scarlet Knights record their seventh straight victory. Lassiter's six-yard drop off the right side pushed Rutgers ahead 10 to nothing after 15 minutes of play. who would hit 32 of 35 extra points and lead the team with 65 points, hit on a 22-yard field goal. Lassiter picked up his second score of the day on a one-yard burst. Joe Mealy gets his first TD of the year, after which Bob Herring unloaded a long bomb to Walt Hynoski for the final count, Rutgers 47, Columbia nothing. I can't say enough about my, uh, my coaches. They're, they're great coaches, and uh, they just work. They work seven days a week, many, many hours each day. They're, they're a loyal group. Uh, each person knows his area. They love Rutgers University, they love the coach, they love the players, and uh, no person could have a better staff than I have. Massachusetts visited for the eighth game, and the Minutemen got a score after just six minutes of play. But all East defensive ace Jim Tatum's goal line interception stopped another UMass drive, and Rutgers launched a 98-yard scoring plus. of completion to Mark Twitty brought the quarter to an end. That set up Rossiter's three-yard drop off left tackle on the first play of the second. Establish the clutch reputation of the Coffin and Twitty combination. The nationally ranked Scarlet defense created a big play. As special team ace Earl Williams blocked the UMass punt, and Mangero showed freshman finesse by falling on the ball in the end zone. Period score by Fisher, Starzl boots a 37-yard field goal to make it Rutgers 34, UMass 7, and victory number 8. With Louisville, Tulane, and Colgate ahead, the Scarlet Knights were starting to feel the pressure, but managed to remain loose through it all.
Honorable mention All-America John Alexander was an example of the relaxed mood in preparation for the November 6th game with Louisville. The 100th anniversary of the nation's first intercollegiate football game between Rutgers and Princeton. of Jim O'Halloran, John Fedorchak, and Nick Sauter. Mark Twitty put Rutgers on the board with a nifty 16-yard reverse. <laughs> Defensive back Henry Jenkins, the nation's top front returner, switches to the offense to surprise Louisville by pulling in a 40-yard pass from Bert Cossett. showed their appreciation for the 34 to nothing win, Rutgers ninth, and the fourth Scarlet shutout. The next stop would be fabulous New Orleans and the spectacular Superdome. Bourbon Street would be visited after a cruise on the Mississippi. Tulane threw an early scare at the Scarlet, taking a quick 10 to nothing lead. And it wasn't until Mark Twitty's sparkling 11-yard reverse that the offense began moving. Marshall's 39-yard field goal on the first play of the second period moved Rutgers to within a touchdown. Washington's one-yard burst after a Greenway fumble tied the game at 10. Rutgers took a brief 17-10 advantage on Lassiter's 13-yard score, knifing between blocks by Walling and Bobby. Tulane then tied the contest and went ahead 20-17 on a field goal, close out an action-packed first half. Cossum sneaked after a long drive, regained the lead for Rutgers, and the Scarlet Knights picked up two more points on a green wave safety to lead 26-20. Starzl's 31-yard boot put the game out of reach for a 29-20 victory, and it was one to go. It came down to Thanksgiving night at Giant Stadium, a 30-degree night before over 33,000 fans, exactly 15 years to the date since Rutgers had last produced an undefeated season. A Colgate field goal on the first Red Raider possession added to the pressure, but Starzl's three-pointer from 43 yards out brought the game even. A second field goal sent Colgate into the halftime dressing room with a 6-3 edge. Would 8-2 Colgate play the role of spoiler? Bert Cossett had the answer. A short toss to Mike Fisher at the end of the third period. A third Colgate field goal success made it a one-point game. But Lassiter's five-yard TD explosion with a minute left and Harrison's game-saving knockdown would soon have old Queen's bell ringing. East linebacker Jim Hughes won for Rutgers an ABC TV scholarship grant as the defensive player of the game. John Walling won the offensive award. The perfect season would bring bright thoughts about the future of football at Rutgers to both athletic director Fred Gruninger and head coach Frank Burns. Rutgers University had several fielders for bowl games. The end result was that we'll be looking for a bowl selection committee next year to pick up where they left off this year. What we didn't get this year gives us the inspiration and the drive to make sure that in the future years that we are ready and that they are ready to select us to represent and be representative of Eastern football. My, my individual goal as a, as a coach here at Rutgers, uh, you know, my, my goal is to beat the teams that we have scheduled. <laughs> and again, I, I will say I certainly will, would hope that uh, our schedule will improve from year to year, and I hope that we are capable of, uh, of making the state proud of our football program by uh, being able to beat those football teams.